evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Wednesday, October the 7th. Today is the day the Church commemorates the life of Henry Melchior Muhlenberg. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you, to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him, because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer to him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Our New Testament reading tonight is from Matthew chapter 9. <clears throat> While Jesus was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, If I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through all that district. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, it be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame throughout all that district. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the prince of demons. And Jesus went out throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like a sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers into his harvest. Moving from the Old World to the New, Henry Melchior Muhlenberg established the shape of Lutheran parishes for North America during a 45-year ministry in Pennsylvania. Born at Einbeck, Germany in 1711, he came to the American colonies in 1742. A tireless traveler, Muhlenberg helped to found many Lutheran congregations and was the guiding force behind the first Lutheran synod in North America, the Ministerium of Pennsylvania, founded in 1748. He valued the role of music in Lutheran worship, often serving as his own organist, and was also the guiding force in preparing the first American Lutheran liturgy, also in 1748. Muhlenberg is remembered as a church leader, a journalist, a liturgist, and above all, a pastor to the congregation in his charge. He died in 1787, leaving behind a large extended family, 
and a lasting heritage of American Lutheranism. The Book of Concord reading tonight is Article 11 on Confession. I think I misspoke last night. We will actually do all of Article 11. It's not that long. But the next section on repentance and on confession and satisfaction, uh, we will probably be in that uh, for sure the remainder of this week and a good part of next week too, uh, because those two articles are quite long. Okay, Article 11, Confession. Article 11, Confession is approved, but they add a correction in reference to confession. They say that the regulation called omnis utrisque be observed and annual confession be made. They also say that, although all sins cannot be named, they should be recalled with diligence. Those that can be recalled should be specified. We will speak at greater length about this entire article after a while, when we will explain our entire opinion about repentance. It is well known that we have made clear and praised the benefit of absolution and the power of the keys. Many troubled consciences have derived comfort from our teaching. They have been comforted after they heard it, that it is God's command, no, rather the very voice of the gospel, that we should believe the absolution and regard it as certain that the forgiveness of sins is feel freely granted to us for Christ's sake. We should believe that though this, through this faith we are truly reconciled to God. This belief has encouraged many godly minds and, in the beginning, brought Luther the highest praise from all good people. This belief shows consciences sure and firm comfort. Previously, the entire power of absolution has been kept under wraps by teaching about works, for the learned persons and monks taught nothing about faith and free forgiveness. Concerning the time, certainly most people in our churches frequently use the sacraments, absolution, and the Lord's Supper during the year. Those who teach about the worth and fruit of the sacraments speak in a way that invites people to use the sacraments frequently. There are many writings by our theologians about this subject that the adversaries, if they are good men, will undoubtedly approve and praise. Excommunication is also pronounced against the openly wicked and the haters of the sacraments. These things are done both according to the gospel and according to the old canons. A fixed time for confession is not prescribed because all are not ready in the same way at the same time. Yes, if all were to come at the same time, they could not be heard and instructed in order. The old canons and fathers do not appoint a fixed time. The canon speaks only in this way. If any enter the church and be found never to commune, let them be taught that, if they do not commune, they come to repentance. If they commune, if they wish to be regarded as a Christian, let them not be thrown out. If they fail to do so, let them be excommunicated. Christ says that though the, those who eat unworthily eat judgment to themselves, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11.29, so the pastors do not force those who are not qualified to use the sacraments. Concerning the enumeration of sins and confession, people are taught in such a way as not to trap their consciences. It is helpful to familiarize inexperienced people to name some things in order that they may be more readily taught. We are now discussing what is necessary according to divine law. Therefore, the adversary should not quote for us the regulation omnis ut trisque, which we already know, but they should show from the divine law that the complete naming of sins is necessary for obtaining their forgiveness. The entire church throughout all Europe knows what sort of snares this point of regulation is cast upon consciences by commanding that all sins be confessed. The matter was only made worse by the summists who collected the circumstances of the sins and added their own ideas. What mazes there were! How great a torture for the best minds! The immoral and ungodly were in no way moved by these instruments of terror. Afterward, what tragedies did the questions about one's own priests stir up among the pastors and brethren, who then were by no means brethren when they were warring about jurisdiction of confessions? We believe that, according to divine law, a complete listing of sins is not necessary. This is also pleasing to Panorimitanus and many other learned legal scholars. Nor do we want to burden the consciences of our people by the regulation omnis ut trisque. We judge it to be like any other human tradition. They are not acts of worship necessary for justification. This regulation commands that we do something impossible, that we should confess all sins. However, it is clear that most sins we neither remember nor understand, according to Psalm 19.12, who can discern his errors. 
If the pastors are good men, they will know to what extent they should examine inexperienced persons. But we do not want to sanction the torture of the summists. It would have been more tolerable if they had added one word about faith which comforts and encourages consciences. About this faith which obtains the forgiveness of sins, there is not a syllable in so great a mass of regulations, commentaries, summaries, or books of confession. Christ is nowhere read there. Only the lists of sins are read. The greater part is occupied with sins against human traditions. This is most useless. The doctrine has forced many to despair. Godly minds were not able to find rest because they believed that by divine law, listing was necessary. Yet they experienced that it was impossible. Other faults of no less importance cling to the doctrine of the adversaries about repentance, which we will now recount. We will recount those beginning tomorrow evening. We join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us, spare all the dying. From all sin, from all evil, from the devil's might, from the devil's wiles, from your wrath and from hell's torment, from sudden and evil death, good Lord, deliver them. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, help them, good Lord. In the hour of death, on the day of judgment, help them, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, good Lord, to comfort all the dying, to forgive them all their sins, to lead them out of this misery into eternal life. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd of your people, we give you thanks for your servant Henry Melchior Muhlenberg, who is faithful in the care and nurture of the flock entrusted to his care, so they may follow his example in the teaching of his holy life. Give strength to pastors today who shepherd your flock, so that by your grace your people may grow into the fullness of life intended for them in paradise, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.